Okay, well, hi, everyone. We're going to get started. My name is Robin Worthington, and I am an adjunct professor of history uh, here at Bristol Community College. Um, I was a Bristol Community College student at one point. You all should know. I graduated from BCC in 2001, and then I transferred to Wellesley College, and that's where I received my bachelor's degree in history. And I did my undergraduate thesis there uh, on the Narragansett Indians and their conversion to Christianity during the Great Awakening. I spent a semester in law school and decided that that was not my calling. And so I went from there to the University of Connecticut and worked with a wonderful, wonderful scholar of Native American history, Nancy Shoemaker. And here I am back at BCC now teaching. And so today I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking with you about some of the early interactions between Native peoples in southern New England and the colonists that came over from Europe. All right. How are these screens? Can everyone see? No, we're saying no. They're too, it's too bright. Yes? Yes. Preset two. Okay, but that's going to upset my friend back there with the camera. Okay, all right. There, is that better? Okay, all right, super. Now I just have to figure out the best place for me to stand so you can all hear me. All right, so everybody always says that you should start a talk <coughs> or a speech with a joke. So here's my feeble attempt at humor. I don't know if you can see that, it's a little fuzzy, but here are some native peoples uh, standing on the shore, in inappropriately dressed, of course, because native peoples in this region didn't dress that way, nor did they live in teepees, but nonetheless, here they are with some Europeans, we're assuming they're English, from the cool little buckle hats, right? And they're landing, and the native peoples are saying, just how long do you illegal aliens plan on staying in the country? Well, the answer to that question was forever. All right, so let's talk a little bit about Native Americans in general. So where, excuse me, when did the first Americans arrive? And I'm not talking, of course, about the Europeans that came starting in 1492. Well, most scholars agree that between 25 to 12,000 years ago, Native peoples came across a land bridge, a land bridge that was formed because of glaciers. And so they migrated from Siberia across this land bridge into North America. And I have a little graphic to show you. And so here's the glaciers, here's Siberia, and here's the land bridge that's created because of the ice. Now this land bridge eventually is covered with water as the glaciers are melted. And so native peoples that have migrated across are stuck here with two giant oceans on each side. Okay? Now, this looks really easy and simple. Whoop, here they come, right? But this took thousands of years. And there was also back migration. So people went back and forth across this land bridge. Of course, Oh, hold on, whoop, 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 I'm having a little spasm here, hang on. Of course, most Native peoples don't believe that they, their ancestors came across this Bering Strait, and instead they believe that their people have been in North America since what they would call time immemorial. And each Native American culture has a way of explaining it, and they call that a creation myth. So how many Native peoples lived here in 1492 in North America? Well, early in the 20th century, some scholars got together and they decided, well, let's try to figure this out. And what they used were records of early explorers and colonists. And they came up with a figure of less than one million. However, new methods of calculation came along. And nowadays, most people would say 
between 2 and 18 million people north of Mexico. Now that's a big, big gap there. You could drive a truck through those two numbers, right? But that's about as close as we can get. Most experts guesstimate somewhere in between those two figures. So what they would say, though, is that the population of North and South America together probably added up to about one-fifth of the world's population. <coughs> Is anyone taking notes and want me to go slower? Or are we OK? All right. And as an example, I offer you the fabulous city of Tenochtitlan. Now, Tenochtitlan is a, was a city where, um, in the place that we now call Mexico. And this was the home of the Aztecs. And at the time that Cortes invaded Tenochtitlan, the population is estimated about 200,000. Now, that's just in the city. That's not in the surrounding territories. And that's certainly not the other peoples that were in the area that paid tribute to the Aztecs. In contrast, at that same time, Seville, Spain, only had about 70,000 people. So what kind of implications can we draw from those figures? Well, first of all, we can say that the Americas were very well populated by 1492. And they were inhabited by very diverse and complex cultures and civilizations. Primary sources that I've read of um, Spanish that came with Cortes, the conquistadors that went into Tenochtitlan, write of a fabulous city, a city, they claim, that they've never seen the likes of before. There were fruit trees. There were beautiful waterways and gardens, uh, beautifully decorated homes. So this idea that people in um, the Americas were these migrating bands of hunters and gatherers doesn't always hold together. So since we're going to talk about New England tonight, let's stop for a minute and think about what New England might have looked like before 1492. Well, before 1300, scholars pretty much divide up the people who lived in this region into three groups based on where they lived. There's something called the interior uplands, and I will show you a map in a minute to help you a little bit. There's interior river valleys, and then there were people who lived along the coastlands or estuaries. And their resources, the resources that were available to them, determined how they lived, what kinds of food they, lived, they ate, and where they traveled. That kind of makes sense to us, right? And here's that map I was telling you about. And so the interior uplands would be up here, and then the river valleys would be something like in here, and then, of course, the coastlands and estuaries all along that big, long coast. Now, the coastlands, uh, coastal peoples, the peoples that lived along the coastal lands and the estuaries, lived in some pretty dense settlements. And these were stable social groups, and they had a lot of migration. For example, in the summertime, they might spend quite a bit of time along the shore looking for shellfish, eating, eating fish in general, and then in the winter, move further inland so that they could take advantage of hunting deer, rabbit. Now, along the coast, these folks lived in family units, extended families. Uh, mothers, fathers, children, aunts, uncles, grandparents. And they had family governments. In other words, families governed themselves. So there was no overarching political system at this time. Now, about 50% of their calories came from fish. 
and that also makes sense to us, right, since they live so close to the coast. But then something really significant happens to change their living patterns. Between 1300 and 1600, these coastal communities start to grow corn, maize. And at that point, households become permanent residents. Okay, any of you that have taken uh, history uh, 111 here at BCC will know that one of the first things that happen when people start to grow food and there's a surplus of food is people tend to settle down into one spot. So the society itself begins to change at this point. Wealth becomes less evenly distributed. Some people have more wealth than others. And local sachems, sachems, the political leaders, they start to take on the role of land distribution, deciding who gets what land. So what did these coastal societies look like other than the two factors that I just explained to you, two characteristics? Well, first of all, they had some cultural elements in common. And the first thing was they all spoke dialects of a common language. And we call these um, folks part of the Algonquian language group. And everywhere here, in this sort of awful pinky, orangey, red color, uh, is, would be peoples who also shared the Algonquian language. So it's a pretty pretty common and widespread language for native peoples. They also had set rules about the division of labor. And they divided labor along gender lines. Men would perform work that would take them away from home. So they were the hunters, the fishers. They caught birds. Women stayed closer to home for child care and for foraging for berries. Right? But interestingly, in Native American cultures, at least in southeastern New England, the women were the ones that did the farming. And this is very, very different from what the English are going to bring over when they come. They also had some shared religious beliefs. They had really similar ideas about, about how the cosmos was structured. Right? They believed that the world was divided up into three levels, the upper world, the lower world, and the middle world. And they also <coughs> believed that there was this power, a powerful source called Manitou. Um, and the Manitou bound all the parts of the universe together. So think of it sort of as a web, a web of interactions. They also believed that animals and people had different amounts of this Manitou, this sacred power, we could call it. And it's obtained through rituals, through prayer, and through fasts. And I'll give you an example. When hunters were getting ready to go hunt, excuse me, I need a drink. I have to wet the pipes. When hunters were ready to go out in a hunting party, and it was usually men that did the hunting, as I explained to you before, they would get themselves ritually ready. So they would fast. They would perform rituals so that they would have success in hunting. When they came back from their hunting trips, they would go through the same thing, more ritual, more fasting, to prepare themselves to re-enter their communities in a safe way. Now, this sacred power, or Manitou, what it basically did was it gave Native peoples the skills to sustain what we would call a high quality, or what they would call a high quality of life 
one that was free from harm, meaning illness, meaning injury, and most especially to remain free from the control of others. Now, there were also certain people that had great amounts of sacred power, and these were powwows or shaman. They were healers, they were prophets, they were, they were powerful sorcerers. They, had a, they carried a lot of power in Native American communities of this, in, this, in this area. If you were sick, or if a member of your family was sick, you'd call the powwow or the shaman, and they would come to you, they'd come to your wigwam, and they would help you to get well by performing certain rituals. Trade was also extremely important to Native peoples in southern New England. Trade networks really tied people together. It created alliances with people. And these alliances and the, well, I should say the trade wasn't always equal. The equality of the trade wasn't the important thing. Right? The value was in the act of the exchange. So when we hear that old uh, story that everyone likes to tell about how the island of Manhattan was sold for a string of beads, well, this idea may help us a little bit to understand what went on. Another form of trade between Native peoples in southern New England was something called tribute. So what would happen is groups with greater power, military power, wealth, greater numbers of people, right? because people are always a really valuable resource. Humans are the most valuable resource of all. They would accept tribute from groups with less power. What might less powerful peoples get in return? Protection. Protection, exactly. Now sachems, those political leaders that I mentioned before, they were very involved in long distance trade. And there was a lot of long distance trade that went on. And this position eventually evolves into a hereditary office, a patrilineal hereditary office. We all know what patrilineal means, right? Where are all my students? What does patrilineal mean? Father to son, Father, son uncle to nephew, along the male lines. Interestingly, however, land allocation is matrilineal. It's passed along from mother to daughter, from aunt to niece. And this goes back to what I told you earlier about who, was the, who were the farmers, the women. Now, three really important, three significant events happen when Europeans arrive that, that really change the lives of Native peoples in southern New England in a very dramatic way. The first thing is something we call virgin soil epidemics. Europeans bring all kinds of germs over to the Americas that native peoples have not been exposed to. You know how when you're a little child and you go get those inoculations that everybody always loves, right? They expose you to these germs. Your, your body builds up uh, antibodies against them. Well, those big oceans that I was telling you about before, that protected native peoples from the germs. Europeans were really germy. They had all kinds of awful, awful diseases. Plague and measles and typhus and all kinds of smallpox. Terrible, terrible diseases that native peoples just had never been exposed to before. And this is an image that's actually drawn, that was drawn by a native person from South America. And we know that because of the attire. See this attire, it looks almost like perhaps Peru. Right? <coughs> but you can see how they had already figured out that this was contagious. 
And I believe this looks as though we're dealing with smallpox here. Well, these epidemics come in waves. And they're so destructive because just as one wave is going through and people are starting to recover, another wave comes along. And so people don't have a chance to recover. And the population doesn't have a chance to recover. Between 50 to 90 percent mortality rate in some places. Some places see upwards of 100. The island of Hispaniola, where Christopher Columbus lands, all of the original native peoples are wiped out. Now, someone also pointed out to me when I gave this talk this morning that part of the problem, or part of the uh, mortality rate, was the brutality of Christopher Columbus and his crew. And yes, I, will, I totally agree with that. Um, but disease, disease was really a primary killer of native peoples. In fact, 1616 to 1619, epidemics pretty much depopulate a lot of the coastal communities of Massachusetts. And so in 1620, when the English pilgrims, or who we call pilgrims, came along to settle north of Cape Cod and not on Plymouth Rock, as you've been told forever, right? they're treated to what they call vacant land. Right? And it really was a treat for them because this land was uh, empty of big trees. All the brush had been removed. This was land that had been prepared by native peoples for agriculture. So when the pilgrims arrive, wow, this is great. Everything's all ready for us. And they still had a heck of a time. The second thing that changes in a very profound way is that important trade that I talked to you about before. Because Europeans very quickly discover how important trade is to native peoples. It's this idea of reciprocal trade, reciprocity. So the Dutch, the French, the English all became involved in what we call the fur trade. Furs were really desired in Europe, especially beaver furs. Does anybody know what they used beaver furs for in Europe? Somebody said it. Hats. hats. Yes, exactly. Hats. Beaver hats. There they are. Ooh. All these wonderful hats. And why beavers? Why beaver fur? Water repellent, yeah, definitely. So these competing colonists cause rivalries between native groups. Right? They're competing to see who's going to be able to provide these furs for uh, Europeans. And so this, what starts as a reciprocal exchange of goods, something that reinforces equality, between native peoples eventually becomes a source of inequality and so a lot of tension. Another problem. Europeans discover that there's a really important, a really important good that native peoples really covet in value. And this is something called wampum. Does anyone know what You've heard of wampum before? Yes? OK. Wampum is made from shells. And there's blue, and there's white. And Roger Williams tells us that the blue was twice as valuable as the white. Well, native peoples in New England and other places use wampum as a marker of status. So high status people in a society would wear strings of wampum so everyone would know that they were a person of status. Another use of wampum is that they were woven into treaty belts. Now, someone that was going to represent their, uh, their group at a treaty uh, negotiation would memorize a speech 
based on a wampum belt. And a wampum belt, in that case, was used as like a mnemonic no, device. And so they would take the belt with them. They would memorize their speech. Of course, Native peoples you probably know at this time are all make use of oral tradition and not written. And once they got to the treaty negotiations, they would unroll their wampum belt, and then they would be able to recite word for word back their part of the negotiations. As a matter of fact, some native people said that the wampum beads actually spoke to them. They would whisper to them, uh, whisper the words back to them. And there's a little picture for you of the shelves. And I think those are belts there. And here's some, some strings of beads. And here is a kind of green and gross picture of someone using a wampum belt in a negotiation. This is a, a treaty negotiation here. There's the wampum belt. What eventually happens is as this wampum is um, used by traders for furs, wampum actually turns into currency. It becomes like money. And the coastal communities who have greater access to shells are really in the thick of this trade, right? And that makes sense to us too. The Narragansett and the Pequot, coastal peoples, and they become brokers of wampum. The third thing that happens that's really uh, changes uh, things in a very significant way for Native peoples, and I would argue probably the most significant thing, is something we call the Great Migration. And, and this is when like just tons of English colonists pour into New England. In fact, in 1634, where there were 4,000, by 1638, there were 11,000. And maybe 11,000 doesn't seem like a lot of people to us, but keep in mind that these folks were crowded into the same areas. When they arrived, okay, they weren't saying like, okay, look at all this land, we're going forth. Right? They wanted to settle where other people were that spoke the same language, that had the same culture, and so people tended to cluster in, in, in cities and towns and villages. Well, as the population is increasing of colonists, there's also a decline in the fur market. The bottom kind of falls out, if you will, of the fur market. And instead of furs, now colonists want land. Land becomes the commodity of choice. They had quickly outgrown all the land that was available because of disease, because of the epidemics, and now they started to focus on the land that they thought native peoples were misusing. And I'll explain why they thought they were misusing it. In order to have enough land for hunting for their bands and communities, native peoples set aside a good amount of land that to colonists just look like wilderness. These were areas for hunting. Well, as far as English were concerned, if the land wasn't fenced in, if you didn't have a house or some other uh, building on the land, it wasn't being used properly. You, didn't, you weren't improving the land. And so this is the land that colonists now set their eye on. In fact, Roger Williams tells us that at this time that land had become one of the great gods of New England. Well, what happens is these land-hungry settlers start to disrupt the places where native peoples get their food. English cows start to trample and eat Indian corn. Now, neither cows nor pigs were native 
to North America. The colonists brought those animals with them, um, and they didn't fence them in. The English fenced in their crops. They didn't fence in their animals. Their animals ran about. So native peoples would find colonist cows chomping away at their corn, the corn that they needed to put away for the winter so that they would survive the winter. Right? English pigs dig up the clan banks, another source of food for native peoples. And English squatters start to build on hunting grounds. Now, sachems try really hard to hold on to their lands, and sometimes they even use the colonial courts. Sometimes they're successful, sometimes not. And so, we're kind of falling off the slide there, I'm sorry. They're provoked into what we can call a new area of, confront a new area of contact, confrontation. And the first major conflict of the region is called the Pequot Wars of 1636-37. And it occurs when colonists try to extend their control over land in the Mystic River Valley in southeastern Connecticut. So we're talking about this area right here, we're back to our same map, right, right here. Over there, right. And what sets this off is the death of an English trader. The Pequot are blamed for this. They're blamed for the death of this trader. And they ask the Pequot to turn over whoever has killed this trader, and they refuse. And so the colonists use this as a reason to declare war and to attack the Pequot. And so in May of 1637, the colonists, together with some allies, some Narragansett and some Mohegan, travel to the site of the Pequot uh, Fort in Mystic, Connecticut. Now at that time, at the fort, there were well, maybe 300 to 700 women, children, and elderly men in the 40 wigwams inside. The other men were away. They were away on, a, on a, either a hunting or a warring party. And this is an artist rendition of what that fort might have looked like. And the first thing I want you to notice is, you see there's a palisade around the outside. Right, like a very high wooden fence. And inside here we see the wigwams and some crops over here. And this is a very famous drawing, very famous drawing, sort of an aerial view right, of what the, the fort might have looked like. And just to orient you again, here's the palisade. And inside are the wigwams. And all around the outside here, these are English soldiers, English colonial army out here. And then the outer border are their Indian allies. And notice there's only two spots for people to come in and out, here and here, right? Here and here. Well, the English decide to set fire to the wigwams. They throw in torches. They get them going. As people try to escape through here, you can only imagine what happens. There are all these guns at the ready. Seven survivors. This is a terrible, terrible blow to the Pequot. The Pequot basically lose the war. There's this somewhat infamous saying later um, by a British soldier who says, if you want to kill lice, 
if you want to get rid of lice, you kill the nits. So in other words, if you want to exterminate a people, you kill the women and children so that they can't reproduce. And that's exactly what happened here. Now there are problems in Plymouth Colony too, right around the same time, maybe a little bit later. And here we are, right, the iconic Thanksgiving feast. Right? We've all heard about this since we were, what, two, three, as soon as you could eat turkey, you heard about the Thanksgiving feast. And before this feast, before the original Thanksgiving, Massasoit, who's the sachem of the Poconoket Wampanoag, forms an alliance with the colonists. And that's why they were at the Thanksgiving quote unquote feast. Right? He forms an alliance with them. And we talked about alliances before, and I told you that alliances were made uh, with, through, among different groups of people. Well, Massasoit makes this alliance with the colonists because he has an eye towards southeastern, uh, uh, southeastern uh, peoples, for example, the, the Narragansett. The Narragansett at this time are probably, not probably, they are the most populous and the strongest uh, Native American group in the area. So the um, Massasoit is looking down there and seeing that, well, Narragansetts are pretty strong. We need alliances. Maybe these new folks, we don't really know who they are, but let's introduce ourselves and let's align ourselves with them. Well, after Massasoit's death, his first son, not Medicom, takes over the sachemship, but he's killed. So his second son, Medicom, who's called King Philip, by, King Philip by the colonists, um, figures out that he simply cannot keep colonists from taking more and more Wampanoag land. It's just not working out, at least not peacefully. And so in 1675, what, there's, a, there's a, a gentleman by the name of John Sassamon. And John Sassamon is actually a Native American. But he's learned to read and write English, and he acts as a go-between between, between uh, Philip and the English. Well, Sassamon turns up dead. And the English decide that it is... Uh, Wampanoag warriors that have killed that got killed him, and so they hang three Wampanoag warriors at, in retribution. Well, this is like the straw that breaks the camel's back for Philip, and so he attacks the town of Swansea, and this starts off King Philip's war. And this is an amazingly destructive war for both colonists and native peoples. Well, the war initially goes well for the Wampanoag. As a matter of fact, they attack many towns in the region in the summer and fall of 1675, and they completely destroy 12. They completely destroy 12. They've learned very well what total war is about, and they've learned it by watching the English. They watched the English uh, totally just annihilate the Pequot. Um, initially, Native American warfare, when Native Americans went to war, their primary concern was captives. And in fact, the sources tell us that that is why the Narragansett and the Mohegan went to the Pequot Fort. They thought they would get captives. Well, there's two catastrophes that happen to turn things against the Wampanoag. The Narragansett have remained neutral in this conflict, and they do so at the behest of Roger Williams. They stay out of the war, but they agree to take women and children and elderly under their protection. Well, they take them to a fort down in South County, Rhode Island, which is pretty well hidden in a swamp. 
But the colonial army discovers where they are, and they do it. It's questionable. Some people say they were spied on. Some people say, well, it was a Native American that gave them away. We don't really know, but they figure out where they are. Well, as they did in Mystic, they burned down the fort with people in, with the inhabitants inside. And the reason why they have access to the fort is because it happens to be a really cold winter and all the water is frozen, so they can just walk right across. Well, estimates of how many um, people are killed uh, in this massacre vary 400 all the way up to 1,000. Well, after this happens, not Roger Williams or anyone else can keep the Narragansett out of the war. By the end of the war, thousands, thousands of New England native peoples are killed and colonists. Right? Medicom is killed. Medicom's head is cut off and stuck on a pike and set in the middle of Plymouth as a horrible warning to both native peoples and the English. And the warning is, if you do not obey God, if you do not do as God wants you to, bad things will happen. Any Wampanoag survivors are sold into slavery, some down to the Sugar Islands. Reportedly, King Philip's wife and his son are sold into slavery onto the island of Bermuda. Some people I just read recently trace their lineage back to King Philip's son. Narragansett survivors are sold into indentured, servit it's indentured servitude to, to families in Rhode Island, or at least the ones that are captured. So if you're a three-year-old Narragansett and you're captured, you might be sold into indentured servitude for 20 or 30 years. If you're a 20-year-old Narragansett, you might only have to serve 10 years. Why would that be? Why would they want to have a three or four-year-old child in debt? They can't do as much work as an adult. Big overlooking, maybe? Mm-hmm. Why? Well, yes, actually. It's really, if you think about it, it's a very insidious way to exterminate a people, right? to exterminate a culture. If you take a child that's three or four years old and you, they don't know anything about their own culture or they forget it very quickly and they're raised up in the English way, they forget, they forget what it's like to be a Native American. Jill Lepore, who's a very well-known uh, historian uh, at Yale and also writes for The New Yorker, wrote a wonderful book about King Philip's War. Sorry about that. And she argues in this book that the experience of King Philip's War is really the beginning of a group identity for colonists. It's the way that, the, sorry, I have that on a timer. Whoops. Go back. There we are. It's a way that they separate themselves from the English over in Europe. And it's really the starting of Americans thinking of themselves as American. And one more thing that I'd like to say to you, and that's why you keep seeing these pictures come up, is that for me, the most interesting part of studying and teaching Native American history is that despite all the tragedy, despite all the horrors that Native peoples go through, despite all the roadblocks that are put in their way, and all the attempts at 
we have to call it genocide, the amazingly creative and adaptive, just amazingly, they think of all kinds of ways to survive what's put in front of them. And that's why I brought these pictures along. These are both some Pequot and Narragansett Indians that are still with us today. Okay. Now, I'll take any questions from anyone who would like to. Anyone have any questions for me? Yeah. Yes, I have one. You mentioned the Wamp uh, after the King Philip's War, uh, the Wampanoag, um, they were turned into slavery while the Narragansetts were, they were just um, servants. Mm -hmm. uh, so, like, so like, what was the difference between them since they didn't really, like, did they really know money at that time? Does it get paid or how? As an indentured servant? What was an indentured servant? Yeah. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. An indentured servant was someone that, um, uh, was held, was obligated to give X number of years of service. Okay, it was like a contract. Okay. And it's the most common use of indentures, like many, many um, Europeans who couldn't afford their passage to the Americas would indenture themselves. They'd say, okay, I will um, work for you for 10 years after I get to the Americas, right? And if you, 10 years for you if you pay my passage over. But then once the contract is up, then they're free. But okay. okay, well, like slavery, you're never free, right? In the kind of slavery that we're thinking, we're, that we're talking about at this time when we're saying slavery, someone's enslaved down, let's say, to the Sugar Islands. Yeah, and the survival rate in the Sugar Islands was, sugar um, plantations, the survival rate for slaves was really, really, really short. That was a very brutal, uh, labor-intensive crop. <coughs> Anyone else? Don't you think, um, it's always amazing me, like when you see, have these weekend powwows, don't you think that the Narragansetts and a lot of these Indians uh, have still lost their identities? Because, you know, you don't, they, didn't, they didn't have TPs, uh, they didn't wear head gear like they wear in these uh, powwows today. Well, I would say two things to that. First of all, how, how do we expect um, Native peoples to um, look and dress today? Not like that. They must have known, but they, they must know that they didn't, they didn't have that gear like that here. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess what I'm trying to say is we don't still dress the way pilgrims dressed, so to speak, right? So people change and evolve, right? So maybe, I guess what I'm trying to say is maybe their change in their approach to their culture um, has more to do with um, expectations of um, their audience. I've often found that to be, um, true, I'm, I understand what you're saying, but I often find that to be kind of sad in a way. I mean, you don't ever see, uh, 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 what was uh, the uh, type of, uh, uh, they didn't live in wigwams. The wigwams, yeah. You never see the wigwams there, you know, and you don't see anything, any attempt to look like what they must have looked like. Well, wigwams, first of all, are not exactly portable. No, they're not. So it's I much easier, to, much easier to put up a tent. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know for sure. I'm just kind of brainstorming, yeah, right? But it, it would be my guess not knowing for sure, my guess would be that they're putting on a performance for an audience. Mm. And most people, when they think of Native Americans, they think of teepees, they think of um, feather headdresses, um, and so they're playing to their audience. Mm. Okay. I guess, too, the case of it, and I can certainly think the you're looking for a certain degree of authenticity uh, based on what, and I, I guess I can imagine it too, it's like it would be something like if we were to do African American cultures or African, they, they really were diverse populations. Mm -hmm. So when you get folks who are, are, are far removed from that, we kind of have snippets mm -hmm. of the past. Mm -hmm. And maybe we bring those together and we're celebrating, 
different aspects or different uh, communities within right. those um, those activities, and not purely, you know, maybe something that we saw, you know, that would be, you know, to be purely a New England uh, mm -hmm. a, a, a Native American experience. So maybe that's why we're getting some of the blending. Well, and to, I mean, Native Americans have always had this problem of authenticity, right? If they don't act a certain way, if they don't dress a certain way, they're not authentic Indians, right? But as I was saying before, we don't go around in those crazy hats with the buckles and the, you know, boots and short pants and, you know, so how do you, ex you know, you can't really expect Native peoples to act and dress the way they did hundreds of years ago, right? So they're kind of caught between a rock and a hard place with this authenticity thing. If they change, they're not real Indians. And if they stay the same, what place do they have in our society? Then they're just a relic from the past. Some theories don't add up, though. I mean, the pilgrims get here, that rough winter of 1620, they're starving to death. They have guns, they can hunt, mm -hmm. but yet they're starving to death. Uh, they make an alliance with the local, the regional Native Americans to um, get game mm -hmm. for them. Or well, not really, not really game. They're, they're more like advice. Oh yeah, tons. Plus, think of think of think of who is coming. Okay, pilgrims, these these so-called pilgrims. Okay, they're coming from the Netherlands. Okay? They've lived in the Netherlands. They're 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 separatists. Okay, they have left England because they don't agree with the Church of England. They don't want to practice uh, pro the Protestantism that the Church of England practices. There's many other groups dissented from the, the uh, European areas, such as England and the Dutch. Right, but what I'm trying to say is these are city folk. These are city folk. And now they come over to some place, first of all, that is really different for them. Okay? And we're not talking about... Right. Well, they did have a choice. They could have stayed in the Netherlands because it was open and tolerant there. They decided to leave because they were concerned that their children were lo losing their identity. They were losing their English.